Brother John D. Berry is known for so many different things. If you are a resident of the state of Tennessee, you may know him as one of the individuals in the legislature of the state, and we appreciate the representation he gives the state of Tennessee in that area. You may know him as the preacher for the Coleman Avenue Church of Christ. You may know him as the one who has the television program put on by the Coleman Avenue Church on Sunday afternoons. I believe it's uh, about 4 o'clock, is it? 4.30? Or 4 o'clock to 4.30? And uh, is that Channel 14 in uh, some of the Memphis uh, cable systems? I think it's Channel 14, and it's a great program. And uh, the thing that I love about Brother D. Barry is this. He is a gospel preacher. And you will not have one bit of trouble understanding where he's coming from and what he's saying. When he finishes, you will know what he meant because he will tell you what God said in the Word. And so a perfect choice to talk to us about a word restorer is a gospel preacher who loves the, the God of heaven and loves the gospel of Christ and loves souls of men. Brother D. Barry, it's a joy to have you back with us. We always look forward to the chance to hear you preach the message of God. Come and preach to us now at this time. This has got to be one of the most unnerving places on the planet to preach because a place that is known for great preachers, when you uh, sit here and listen to Brother Clark uh, mention Brother Lydell and Brother Elkins and one of my heroes, Brother Taylor is in the audience and, and all the fine men, Brother Hutley and others who are here, you, don't, you shouldn't start calling names, but when, you, when a place is called a school of preaching, it's, uh, it, it's somewhat unnerving when you know that you've got to go to that particular place where they teach people to preach, to preach. And I, I thank God so much that the brethren of this congregation and those who are the curators and the administrators and the supporters of this great school that has done so much to save this planet uh, in, the, in the times in which they have given so much, this congregation has given so much. I thank God so much for each and every one of you. And I, I, I am so appreciative that you allow me to be part of it. My, my brother has been here this week participating and, and assisting and representing the congregation, uh, helping to take care of our brothers and sisters and in the hospitality that this congregation and Coleman and other congregations extended. And I thank him for that. I think my, my wife is somewhere in the audience. I don't know, raise your hand if you're somewhere <laughs> in the audience. There she's there, and folks from Coleman, y'all raise y'all's hand if you don't mind. We got a lot of folks from Coleman and Horn Lake and Levi uh, here who also had told me that they were coming. And just as Brother Clark has said, folks from all over the country, because this is an important gathering of God's people. And when we come together as we have on this occasion, it is for us to do everything we can to fortify and strengthen one another in the most holy faith, because Lord knows that the battle is being brought to us and we've got to make the stands that the Lord has commanded for us to make. I thank God so much for each and every one of you and I hope and pray that I can say something on this evening that will be edifying to you. My mama was a woman you hear me talk about all the time. My mama and my daddy, my, my dear, my big mama, my big papa. So y'all have heard about all of these people so many times when I preach. That was an occasion when we were children. Edward doesn't remember because he was the baby at that particular time. Or maybe Bunny may have been the baby, but I think Edward was the baby. And Mama was, was one of those women who my father worked. And in that particular era, in the, the mid and late 50s and 60s, most women stayed at home. Well, when Mama finally took a job and she was going to work because she wanted a new washing machine, my dad had said, we'll get it at a certain point in time, but Mama wanted it sooner. So she, she went and got a job at one of the department stores, and she was going to work there. Well, it, it, it came to a particular time when school was out in the summertime that Mama gave us a, a, a directive. She said, you all stay in the house. 
And she told us to stay in the house, Brother Clark. Don't go out of the house. Don't open the door for any strangers. I was the eldest at the time. Uh, my sister Rinda and Doris and I believe Edward sitting right there uh, was the baby at that particular time. Well, you know, Mama said don't go out of the house. And uh, we found ways of violating that rule. And uh, we, we, you know, the, the back porch is part of the house. Um, the backyard is part of the house. And uh, so we found ways of violating that rule. And, and plus she had told us certain things to eat and certain things not uh, to eat during the course uh, of, our, of our stay and while she was at work. And uh, we found ways of violating that rule. So when Mama came home, we had pretty much violated every rule that she had given us. We had gone out of the house. We had played in the yard. Uh, trees are part of the house. We had climbed a few trees. Uh, we had eaten up all the lunch meat that she had bought for her lunch for the rest of the week. Uh, we just, man, we just went crazy. What Mama did was she set us down. She, was, she said, I'm too mad to deal with y'all right now. She said, because if I whoop you, I hurt you. And uh, she, didn't, she didn't get out her famous switch that you've ta heard me talk about so many times, but she set us down beginning with me. And she reiterated that law. When I say stay in the house, I mean stay in the house. Do not open the front door. Do not open the back door. If the house is not on fire, you stay within the house. And the yard and the trees, and she went down just as though we were sitting there and with, with uh, no understanding whatsoever. And she made it very clear as to what she meant. And she went from the eldest being me all the way down to the youngest. Do you understand this? Yes, ma'am, we understand this. Because the next time the punishment was going to be doled out and the whippings were going to begin. So we, uh, we understood that. What my mama did on that occasion was restore her word, her authority in our minds so that we had absolutely no way of saying, Mama, I didn't understand. I didn't get it. I thought you meant this. She made it extremely simple to where every last one of us understood what she meant and what she required and what she demanded of us. And when she left, I guarantee you, we were the best children uh, that you've ever seen. Uh, because, you know, um, uh, mama didn't play. And so, uh, and, and, and Lord, if she told our daddy. But uh, be it as it may, on that day, she restored her word in our mind, in our hearts, in our understanding of exactly what she wanted. And she was not going to deviate from it. She made us understand that there was punishment that was attached to disobeying her word. On this day, when we're talking about word restoration and restoring the word to its rightful place in humanity's mind, heart, and soul, I want to give you that little understanding of that little uh, event in our life because our Father and our God is said, as the Apostle Paul told the brethren at Corinth, God is not the author of confusion. That word confusion in that context means instability. And God does not promote, nor does he encourage, nor does he accept instability when he has told us everything we need to know. In him we live, we move, have our being, and he has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. I hope that God's word and the study that we will have together will bless each of us. Let us pray. Merciful God, as we approach you today, we ask you, Father, to give us an opportunity that your word might be implanted within us, that it might strengthen us, edify us, uplift us, and bring us together as your children. We pray, Father, that the things that we say and the things that we do are pleasing and acceptable in your sight. It is in Jesus' name that we humbly pray. Amen. When we look at that word, restoration, that's a pretty, that is, that's a great word when we talk about restoration because restoration being a noun is defined as the process of renewing, repairing, reviving, or reestablishing something. And therefore, it means bringing something back to its original condition, to its original point and purpose. And when we restore something, oftentimes it takes a tremendous amount of work to restore something. I got an old house. And in that old house, my wife is always complaining because I'm always doing something. Because there's always something that needs to be restored. And, you know, I tell folk all the time that old house keeps me tired and broke uh, because there's something that has to be fixed at all times. But I know what it looked like 100 years ago. 
And I wanted to look that way again, so I'll pull out woodworks, I'll replace fixtures, and I'll do things in a methodical fashion because I want to restore it to its original position, its original beauty, and put the vintage look back in there. Don't you understand that restoration therefore means that sometimes you're returning something to its original health, its original dignity, its original fidelity, and even sometimes its original vitality. And when we think about the fact that we are a dual being, we are body and soul, and, and you know when we're in our body, we talk about I'm going to get in shape, I'm going to exercise, I'm going to take my vitamins, I'm going to eat right, I'm going to do this and that because we want to revitalize and reinvigorate our physical man. But when we talk about the restoration that the word brings within our lives, then we're talking about that inner man, that, that part of us when God made us in his image and his likeness, we are separated from the beast and it is that part that we want to strengthen. And it is the word that can restore us because it is the word that when we receive with meekness the engrafted or implanted word of God, it is the word that will bring us back to vitality and bring us back to strength. So it means that there is a pattern. You know, when we were born, there are those who teach that a child is born in sin. Well, it doesn't make any sense to me since I have been taught for years that sin is transgression of God's law. And I'm wondering, when did that baby transgress? So that we know that we are born into this world. We are free of sin. That is generation. We know that there is the seduction of the world to sin, that there is something always around us pressuring us to make the wrong decision, to not act in our own best interest, to make decisions that destroy us, that hurt us, that weaken us, that distract us. And the devil, our adversary, is always there doing everything he can to facilitate you not being what God intends and what God demands that you be. And so therefore, at some point in time, when we reach accountability and we understand right and wrong and we've been taught and raised and matured and we decide to violate or transgress, that is degeneration. With there is generation, we're born free of sin. There is degeneration. We sin, we make mistakes, misstep, misspeak. We act in such a way that God is not happy and, and we are not many times even pleased with ourselves. So there must be regeneration. There must be a restoring, a rebuilding, a revitalizing. There must be a reconstruction. And that's what the word of God does. It helps to regenerate us. After we have fallen, we've made bad decisions because God doesn't want any of us to be lost. When we think about this great lectureship that has been chosen by Brother Mosier and, uh, and all the fine brethren and, and brethren and elders and Brother Clark and others, this is a wonderful, wonderful topic. And it couldn't have been chosen at a better time in the history of our nation. It makes me cringe. When I sit and I watch the 5 o'clock news and I see the retreat of God's people as the devil is on the offensive with his vile and perverted ways and teachings and lifestyles, and too often time we are in retreat. And this is a great time to start talking about restoration and talk about the fact that we as God's people need to make a stand at this juncture in the collective history of our nation and the history of our church, restoration and preservation is something that must be on our minds. Let me tell y'all something. I've got some grandchildren, and my grandchildren, i got beautiful grandchildren. I don't know if they're here tonight, but I know that y'all have children and grandchildren too. I've said it many times, I don't want to see the world that my grandchildren and my nieces and nephews are going to have to grow up in if we don't restore the word right now. If we don't draw a line in the sand for the devil and say, fella, you don't go another further. You stop right here. If we don't get our courage and our backbones to where we make the stand that we've got to make, that God absolutely demands that we make, I don't want to see the world. I hope God just takes me on the way 
so that I don't have to see what my children are going to have to live with and the type of persecution that they're most certainly going to have if they try to be God's people, if they attempt to be Christians. We've got to keep this in mind. When we look in, our, in, our, in the Word and, and the chosen uh, passages and the to chosen text for this lectureship, when we look at the prophet Zechariah, Zechariah is the 11th of 12 men, great men called by God, who wear the designation of the minor prophets. They weren't minor because of their stature or their knowledge or their intelligence or their intuitiveness or their presentation. They just simply had shorter books than Daniel and Isaiah and several others. So he's the 11th of the 12 men that we designate as minor prophets. He lived in the same historical era as Haggai. And, and this man was called from the priestly order and called and given his prophetic determination and his, his job by God in order to wake up God's people and remind them of who they are, whose they are, and what they need to be doing if they're going to stay in compliance with God's law and maintain God's love. Don't you know we need men today? We need men to stand today. We need gospel preachers today. We need God-fearing elders today. We need service-minded deacons today. We need mamas and daddies who are protecting their brood, protecting their children today. We need husbands that will stand for their wives today, wives who will stand with their husbands today. We are in a time not unlike the children of Israel who had left God and had their eyes on the idols. The American idols are all around us. We love materialism and worldliness. We're looking, and the American dream has ceased to be the freedom of religion and the freedom to worship and the freedom to raise your children in the nurture and admonition of God. The American dream has ceased to be the freedom uh, to, to, uh, to do what you would like to do in order that you might be a good person and go to heaven and see to it that your family is protected. But now all we talk about is stuff. We talk about our homes and our cars and our clothes and our money. We talk about those things that are the material things that will eventually be dissolved. The Lord said, what does it profit a man? What have you profited? If you should gain the whole world and lose your own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? The Lord wants us to take our eyes off of these American idols and put our eyes back on his word. Let's restore the word. This is what Zechariah had to do. This is what Haggai had to do. This is what Ezekiel had to do. Each of these men in their particular time, pre-exile and post-exile, each of these men had their particular responsibilities among God's people who have lost themselves. If we go back in their history, we see an occasion where it says there was no king in Israel and every man did what was right in his own eyes. That has become and is continuing to become the standard in America. Whatever you think is right, Whatever makes you feel good. It's your thing, they said in the 70s. Do what you want to do. And don't you understand that's what most people are doing today. Zechariah said in Zechariah, the chapter is 1 and the verse is 3. God told Zechariah, therefore, say unto them, thus saith the Lord of hosts, turn, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. In essence, God says, here's the deal. And America better understand what the deal is. God said, if you turn to me, I'll turn to you. If you obey me, I will protect you. We as a nation, and I'm sorry if, I, if I'm redundant many times and when I say these things, because I hear things that scare me to death and frighten me as I listen at the type of laws that are being passed 
all over this nation. As I see everything we stand for eroded, that was a time when we knew who we were. That was a time when we understood what we fought for. That was a time when we had pride in the fact that we were a religious nation, that we were a nation that feared God. In God we trust. We knew that our existence didn't depend upon our military. England had the best military. We had to get conscripts and get France to come help us, but we also knew, George Washington said, God intended for this to be a nation. We've made our mistakes over the last 400 years. We've had our problems, but the fact of the matter is, we know that this nation is here because God intended for it to be here. And now, my brothers and my sisters, now we've got all this stuff to fight with, but too many of us have forgotten what we fight for, and we have turned our eyes from God, and we have gone after the beggarly elements of the world. Zechariah and even Isaiah had to say to God's people, it's time for you to wake up. Isaiah said, in Isaiah, the chapter is one, and the verse is four. Isaiah said, oh, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, and they have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They have gone away, he said, backwards. Lord, have mercy. We've gone backwards. And, and you know, sometimes I even argue with that. Some people came to me one time and they said, oh, we're going backwards in this country. We're going backwards. And I says, I don't know about that. I'm not sure we're going backwards. Because if we went backwards, we'd go back to a time when folks raised their children. If we went backwards, we would go to a time that when the street lights came on, children got off the street. If we went backwards, we would go to a time that Sunday mornings that families sit on the church benches, mama and daddy and the children all together. If we went backwards, we'd go to a time when men were the head of the household and they conducted themselves in such a way that they could not be called infidels that do not take care of their own. If we went backwards, we'd go back when Eisenhower, before he made his acceptance speech as the president, he pray to God first. If we went backwards, I wouldn't mind that a whole lot. But you, James, I wouldn't care if we went backwards a little bit. Problem is, I'm not sure what direction we're going right now. But I know it's not backwards, Brother Clark, because if we went backwards, we'd go to a time when folks didn't ask their children if they felt like going to school or ask their children if they felt like going to church or ask their children if they felt like studying their homework. You know, if we we went backwards, we'd go to a time when mama and daddy's voice in the house was the law. God said that they were going backwards. But when God said that they were going backwards, they were going back toward the beggarly elements of sin. And don't you know Joshua had to say to the children of Israel on one occasion, when they had left, when God has liberated them, God has brought them through the Red Sea on dry ground. God has fed them in the wilderness in spite of their obstinance and their murmuring and their complaining and their clamoring and their disgusting disobedience for over 40 years. And now that once that God has opened the Jordan also and they are in the promised land of milk and honey, Joshua has to ask them at a certain point before God totally gives them everything. If it seem evil to you to serve the Lord, choose, choose you this day who you will serve. And don't you know a whole lot of us need to choose because we're looking back on what we used to do. I hate to hear some joker say, oh man, boy, that was a day when man, I could cut a rug back in the day. Oh man, that was a day when I could dance all night. Oh man, that was a day when I could party. See, your problem is you're looking backwards. You're not looking forwards. Every one of us have got to look at those days as Paul said, I look back and, uh, at them as though they're a waste. 
as though they are something that I discard. And I think about the fact that Jesus has saved me from my sins. When we think about the progressiveness of sin, as David put in Psalms chapter 1 and verses 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. We see the progressiveness of sin displayed to us right there by David. You know, he said, you start walking with sinners, you start standing around with sinners, you start sitting with sinners. That was an old song that one time said, don't let the devil ride, because if you let him ride, he will surely want to drive. Don't let him flag you down, because if he flags you down, he'll turn you around. And you're talking about the progressiveness of sin, and we see it all the time. David didn't intend to be a murderer. He didn't intend to be an adulterer. He didn't intend to be a transgressor. He was just a peeping Tom somewhere where he shouldn't have been at the wrong time when he should have left town and gone to fight like he was supposed to. But he's walking around up on a roof, spies another man's wife uh, washing herself and from that point as James says let no man say when he is tempted I am tempted of God for every man is tempted when he is drawn drawn away by his own lust and is enticed we have been enticed we've been drawn away by the trappings of this world drawn away by the pleasures of this world, drawn away by the doctrines of this world, and it's becoming increasingly difficult for us to think well about the direction that we are going in this nation. Israel became sinful. Why? They became a sinful nation because they became comfortable with disobedience. They reproduced the evil that had made them vile. They turned their back on the God that rescued them. They committed transgression after transgression without blushing and without shame. They lost themselves, unable to put a difference between the holy and the profane. In essence, what Israel did is what is happening all around us as we see folks making the choice to follow sin rather than follow God. Zechariah understood this and understood his priestly responsibility, his prophetic responsibility, and he warned the people, he warned them of the false prophets, the false prophecies, and the false ways, and the false promises that were connected to the idolatry that was all around them. He told them, for the idols have spoken vanity, and the diviners have seen a lie, and have told false dreams. They comfort in vain. Therefore, they went their way as a flock. He said they were troubled because they had no shepherd. Zechariah chapter 10 and verses 2. How many of us are living our lives like we don't have a shepherd? You've heard me say this before, so pardon my redundancy. Many of us who claim to believe in Christ, we claim to believe in God. We claim to believe in the Bible. We claim to believe in heaven and hell. We claim to believe in God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But you know what? We say, I'm not an atheist. And I say to folks all the time, it's not that you're an atheist. You are a practical atheist. What do you mean, Brother D. Barry? It's not that you don't believe God exists. You just live like you don't believe God exists. Your life says, I don't believe in God. Your actions say, I don't believe in God. Your immorality says, I don't believe in God. Your unfaithfulness says that I don't believe in God. And what Zechariah is saying to God's people is that you are proceeding and moving as though you don't have a shepherd. We've got to wake up, wise up, stand up, be strong. We've got to de develop and gather our courage. And if you don't mind me saying our guts to stand against a world that wants to marginalize us and push us into irrelevancy. 
as a Christian, as a Christian, as a Christian, as a child of God, we cannot let that happen. The world depends on us following our Savior's command. You must be the light of the world. You must be the salt of the earth. You must make the stand that Paul talked about in Ephesians chapter 6 and verses 12. Paul says, don't you understand who you're fighting? Don't you get it? Don't y'all see you're not fighting Bubba, Leroy, Cockroach, and Skillet? You're not fighting Essie May, Betty Lou, and, and Charlie Jean. So you're not fighting them. He says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, didn't he say it, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness and high places. In essence, you are fighting the most powerful people on the planet Earth. You're fighting the folks who have the political authority, the military authority, the financial authority. You're fighting the people who have the wherewithal to change the minds and lives and morality of the folks that hear them. We've got to restore the word. We've got to restore the word because God's way is the only way. If there is a false prophet, there is a false prophecy. If there is a false teacher, then there is a false teaching. If there is a false leader, then there is a false way. If there is a false watchman, then there is a false report. If there is a false standard, then there is a false morality. If there is a false premise, then there are false assumptions, false lifestyles, false authority, false peace, false religions, false credentials, and false deities. Therefore, we've got to restore the word. That is our job, to restore the world. The devil is aggressive. He's bringing the battle to us. We do not have the luxury of being disengaged. We must deploy our resources, our strength, our will, our determination to do everything we can to save all of those and all of that that we love. This is a time to restore the word, my brothers and my sisters. This is a time that it has to be, it must be restored because this is a time that demands Christian apologetics, a time when we must give a courageous, a steadfast, and a rational and adequate defense of the faith as we have been commanded to do. We must do this. We must do this. We're God's people. We must do this. Peter said when Peter knew he was dead man walking, if you don't mind me saying it that way. My brother Peter, your brother Peter, a little bit over 2,000 years ago, knew that the politics and the religious atmosphere was closing in upon him and that he's going to die just as the Lord told him that he would be martyred. Peter knew as an old man, a tired old preacher, a tired old apostle, and he's struggling to get these two books out, 1 Peter and 2 Peter, has a very short amount of time between those two books. And Peter is trying to get this word out to God's people before he dies because they have legislative authority. The Lord told them that 12 men, and with the inclusion 13 of Paul, the most powerful men that have ever lived other than Jesus with the baptismal measure of the Holy Ghost. Whatsoever you bind on earth, he told them in Matthew 16, shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven, having given them the keys of the kingdom. So Peter, know before I die, and this power dies with me, and this supernatural divine knowledge dies with me I can see this old battered tired apostle struggling to write these letters and get them to God's people because he knows what's going to happen he knows after their death the ravenous wolves are going to come after God's people to try to destroy the church 
of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So Peter said to them in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verses 15, Peter said, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you the reason of hope that is within you with meekness and in fear. Peter says, be ready. Be ready. Be ready. When you have to stand, be ready. When it's time to speak, be ready. When it's time to defend what is right, be ready. Paul said in Philippians chapter 1 and verses 17 that he was set for the defense of the faith. Are you set? Are you unmovable? Are you steadfast? Are you rooted? Are you grounded? Are you set that no matter what man says, no matter what they do, no matter how much they lie, no matter how much they threaten, no matter what they take from us, that we are set for the defense of the faith and that we will not waffle, we will not back up, and we will not compromise and capitulate. There are attacks against God now unprecedented, unprecedented in the last 200 years. They are attacking the character of God, attacking the character of Jesus, and destroying the standard, which is the word of God. Certain crooked theologians today use the uh, various uh, uh, psychology and, and mind tricks in order to turn people against the Bible and the validity and the accuracy of the scripture. They're doing everything they can to make men and women stop reading the Bible, calling it an old Bronze Age book that doesn't mean anything anymore. It is out of style. It is out of date. It is out of use. We don't need it. We'll just make up our own morality. And millions upon countless millions are falling for that seduction. I want you to realize what Jude said. Jude said something very well. Couldn't be said better than the way Jude said it. You've heard it your whole life just like I have. Jude said, Beloved, when I give diligence to write unto you of the common salvation... It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you. He says, and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto all the saints there in verses 3. Jude says, earnestly contend. We can't be sunshine soldiers. We can't be like some folks. You know, some folks, they are like blisters. They show up when the work is over. We can't be like that. We've got to be the type of people who are there and ready to stand and let folks know what we believe and why we believe it. We've got to stand and push and protect and contend for the greatest story ever told about the greatest life ever lived. We've got to tell them, for God so loved the world. In a time when folks need to know this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. God didn't send Jesus to make you feel bad. God didn't send his perfect example to make you wonder, I can't make it. But what Jesus came to do was give me the perfect example. He sent not his son to condemn the world, but that the world through him might have life. So that we can tell folks everywhere that Jesus Christ came and he died for me because God don't want to lose any of you. Do you understand that? God doesn't want to lose any of you. He doesn't want to lose your children. He doesn't want to lose your grandchildren. He doesn't want to lose this nation that he has protected and guided and guarded men's hands to write the greatest document ever written by uninspired un, uh, uh, men, the American Constitution. And that Constitution even is being challenged. Why? You, when you challenge the Bible, 
you challenge the Constitution because the Constitution is a document that depends on the validity of the scriptures and the power of that which was inspired by God. This is why the Apostle Paul said to Timothy, this young evangelist and this young preacher who he's sending out into this dark world at that particular time, he wanted him to understand that you've got to preach the word of God. So Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 3, 16 and 17, as all of you can quote, he said, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Paul said, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Therefore, we learn, as Paul said to the brethren in Rome, in Romans chapter 15 and verses 4, in that book that changed the world, that beautiful document that we call the book of Romans, in the Pauline epistles as he wrote to the church at Ephesus, and many of the issues that arose in Ephesus, as he wrote to the church at Colossae, and dealing with many of the issues that had to do with Judaizing teachers, as he wrote to the church in the Philippian letter, dealing with many of the issues that make us understand the mind of Christ. When he wrote to Rome in this great document, one of the things that Paul said to Rome in the hotbed of idolatry and sin and immorality and perversion, Paul said, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Hope is made of two elements, desire and expectations. I can hope because I know that God the promise maker is God the promise keeper. I may not be able to depend on Washington. I may not be able to depend on Capitol Hill in Nashville. I may not be able to depend on the legislative body downtown here in Memphis or in Shelby County, but I can depend on God. I can depend on him, and if he said it, I know that he will keep his word, so therefore I have hope. When I understand the God of the Bible, I will understand that as Paul said to the brethren in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 4, who will have all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. God wants every man every woman, every person to be restored by his word, to be restored in your inward man by his word. And as Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verses 9, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In essence, Peter is saying God don't want to lose anybody. There are no acceptable losses with God. I was talking to a former colonel uh, in the Vietnam War, someone who had fought violently, who had received several Purple Hearts and several uh, uh, major medals for his valor. And he talked about the fact that when he first got uh, to Vietnam and got to his duty station in the early days of the war, that the Pentagon had already shipped about 50,000 body bags to Vietnam. And if you lost a loved one in Vietnam, I am not trying to sound callous, but what I am saying is the Pentagon, 50,000 lives was acceptable losses. So they sent 50,000 body bags. And we lost, I think, just about 50,000 men and women in that particular conflict. Those were acceptable losses for the Pentagon. That was to say that this was a battle fought properly, a war waged properly and technically correct because of the acceptable losses. But let me tell you something about God. God don't want his enemy and your adversary to have anybody. He does not want the devil to get any of his children. He does not want the devil to have any of you. He didn't create hell for you. He created hell for the devil and his angels. He created heaven for you. He wants you with him. The Lord said in John chapter 14 and verses 1, the Lord said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. 
For in my father's house, he said, my father's house, whenever I get tired and weary, I have to think about my father's house. Whenever the load of this world and the battles that I have to fight and the stands that I have to make and the sermons that I have to preach, don't you know, I think about my father's house. He said, let not your heart be troubled, you Believe in God. Believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would tell you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, he said, if I go, and he did go, the apostles stood there gazing up into heaven as he went back to heaven. He did go home. I know he went home. He says, I will prepare a place for you, and I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also. That's my hope. That's my hope. This is why the word strengthens me, restores me, uplifts me, encourages me. This is why God's word is implanted in me, and I take it with me everywhere I go. And every one of us need to do this each and every day of our lives. Keep the word within us. Understand something, my brothers and sisters. The devil wants you to say, quit, just quit, just give up. Just give up. Just quit. Just walk away. Don't you understand what the facts are, he says. There is no proverbial village anymore. The children are raising themselves. Most unchurched, unspiritual, unconverted, unlearned generation in the history of this nation. The men want to be women and the women want to be men. In other words, he says, people are not seeking and they are not accepting the word of God. Why don't y'all just quit, give up, and walk away? We say no. We say no. We say no because we know no matter what we see, the Lord tells us to walk by faith, not by fact, not by sight. When the devil shows us his facts, God already said, Jesus didn't talk about the devil a whole lot, did he? All Jesus had to say is he's a liar. He's a liar. When Jesus said he's a liar, I don't need to talk anymore. That's all I need to know. That he is a liar. So anything he shows me, he's a liar. He was a liar from the beginning. He was a murderer of souls from the beginning. And I don't allow him to tell me anything. That was an old song back in the 30s that used to be when folks had to wind up uh, the, the, the phonograph there and, and put the big old thick record on it. The, the song says, why did you believe me when I told you I loved you when you know I've been a liar all my life? And uh, when, you, when you think about that, why would we believe anything the devil has to say when we know that he is the father of liars? We don't listen to his statistical facts because what he has done is he has made depression, anxiety, terrorism, suicide, greed, immorality, crime, violence, violence, and genocide is that which is on our minds and hearts each day. The Apostle Paul's heart must have been broken. This good man who had been battered and bruised and jailed and whipped and caned and stoned and snake bit and shipwrecked, this man who eventually lost his head on Nero's chopping block, his heart must have been broken when he says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, and the doctrines of devils, as he said to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verses 1. When he went through that catalog of abominations in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 5, when he said men shall be lovers of, their se of themselves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, without control, fears, despisers of those that are good, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Can you imagine as he went through that catalog of abomination how he's thinking 
about what the world has fallen to and what's going to happen to folks, even though he knew and said he was ready to depart. Let me tell you this, brothers and sisters, before I sit down this evening, I want you to realize something. I want you to understand that as religious people, as God's people, when Paul was talking, he was talking about religious people, people who have been, have been turned away, folks who have lost themselves, lost their identity. As Paul said in 1 Timothy 3, 5, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away, that form of godliness that they had, this form, this mannequin, this pretending, this hypocrisy, it's because they denied the word that could have turned them around and fixed their lives. He says they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. That word abominable is a word that should never be associated with a Christian. It means disgusting. Paul said they are going to be disgusting. How do you use that word about Christians? He said they would be disgusting. And he said in every good word, work, reprobate, it means disapproved, disqualified, dishonorable. How do you use those words with God's people? What's wrong? They haven't added the word to their lives. Peter said, and besides this, given all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to your virtue knowledge, to your knowledge temperance, to your temperance patience, to your patience godliness, to your godliness brotherly kindness, to your brotherly kindness charity, love. And then notice what he said. Here's the most wonderful thing that he said within that context. He said, for if, if, if clause here, for if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you should neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. What's the problem? He said in verses 9, but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, for he has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. My brothers and my sisters, I want to ask you a question this evening. How can this be? How can we claim to be God's people? How can we claim to be Christians? And we're not striving to restore the word. We're not fighting to restore the dignity of our Lord and Savior. We're not protecting the divinity of our creator who made us and breathed into our nostrils the breath of life. Paul explained how to Rome. He said, even as they did not like to retain, look at that word, retain God in their knowledge. God gave them over to reprobate minds to do things, he says, which are not convenient. When Paul talked to the brethren there in Romans chapter 1, 28 and 29, that word retain means to hold on to it to store it. He's saying it's not part of us anymore. It's not part of you. You violated your conscience, as he said in 1 Timothy 1 and 19. He says you're letting it slip, as the Hebrew writer wrote in Hebrew chapter 2 and verses 1. Paul said we ought to stop being children, henceforth being tossed to and fro with every wind and doctrine. My brothers and my sisters, I want to ask you a question because all is not well. The human race has set itself on a course of abomination for denying the word and not retaining the word, a course of self-destruction as a generation blindly follows those unworthy of our trust down the moral elevator. The collective character of our once godly nation continues to degenerate as we attempt to live and raise our children and our families in a spiritual vacuum, in a spiritual void without God. 
Religious leaders are becoming worse and worse, self-serving, ungodly, materialistic, turning religion into just another big, nasty, no good business in America. This is happening right around us. We, we, God's people, must restore the word. We must revive our character. We must revive our courage. We must and revive our steadfastness. We must say we're the Lord's people. We're the Lord's church. We will not just go along to get along. We will not march blindly to the sound of the pipe pipers of worldliness and materialism. We will not ditches with those blind who want us to anesthetize or to, to close our minds, blind our eyes and see no evil, hear no evil and speak no evil and just follow them down the primrose path to destruction of everything we love. My question to you, my question to you, are we so addicted to their products, to their merchandise, to their images, to their devices? Are we so addicted to what the devil offers us through his spokesman in this world today when somebody needs to tell me when a half-naked, salacious pop singer began to be the spokesman for American values. Somebody needs to tell me when a confused and seductive talk show host became the authority on what is right in America. Somebody needs to straighten me out on how a brazen, arrogant, entitled, rich, billionaire CEO who is shameless and unscrupulous became the leader of who we are in this nation. When did it happen? When did we stop listening to elders and ministers and teachers? When did we stop reading our Bibles? When did we stop allowing the word to lift us up and strengthen us? When did we allow ourselves to watch that idiot box until our eyes are big as half dollars and our brains as small as a peanut? When did it happen? When did we allow ourselves to, be, to let, let them be our spokesman? When did they become the spokesman of what America stands for and have redefined and reassigned the word of God to oblivion and irrelevancy? When did they allow us to become so mediocre and so irrelevant that we are afraid of being called bullies, bigots, prejudice, that we are afraid of someone says we're standing against their civil rights, their equality, and their individuality, when did we become so afraid and worry so much about what they think that we have allowed them to marginalize us the way they have? My brothers and my sisters, let me tell you something. There's a guy going to come back one day. His name is Jesus. This same fellow that walked out of a tomb one day after he had been in the Hadean ram for about three days, they moved the stone. The men who were guarding the stone fell down like dead men. And a young man who had been on the cross just three days earlier, hanging between two thieves, nailed like a dog on Golgotha's hill for our sins, walked from that tomb and said, All authority, all authority. In heaven and in earth is given unto me. Then he told us to go save the world. Go into all the world. Go to all the world. Tell this story. Tell the world what they did to me. Tell the world how I stood. Tell the world how I cried in that garden and asked my daddy three times. I asked my father three times. Do I have to die for them? The same folks who've been chasing me talking about my mama, talking about my family, calling me out of my name, calling me a blasphemer, beat me half to death and nailed me up on a tree. Do I have to die for them knowing that that's what was going to happen to him? But there was no plan B. I told you this the last time I was here. There was no plan B. If he had stood up on that day and said, they're not worth it, they are not 
worth it. They're not worth it. They're not worth it, Father. I'm coming home. What are we going to do then? We're lost. There's no plan B. That for the foundation of the world, God decided that our salvation was in that young man that was our substitute and our perpetuant. He's coming back one day. He's coming back one day. One day. We can sit around here if we want to. He's coming back one day. We can stand and let folks talk about his church and about his name and about his father and about his book if we want to. But he's coming back one day. And he's going to call every last one of us from labor to reward. My Savior loves me. Today he's my Savior. He is my Savior. But when he comes back, he's going to be my judge.